right, so uh, my name is Michael Harden. I'm the owner of Stadium Pin Blanks. Um, several of you have probably bought some from me. If you haven't, come on see me. I'll give you something to sell. Um, I specialize in a lot of uh, stadiums and historic materials. Uh, my big uh, claim to fame out of the pin making world is I think I've pushed the envelope on how fancy your certificates need to be because your certificates may not be the primary reason why somebody buys a pin from you or you give a pin away, but they certainly look awesome whenever uh, somebody can read a story about it. So that's my little shtick and I, uh, I push that pretty heavy, so I, I like it. That's just me. Today we're going to do uh, Stadium Pin Blank's Magic Juice demo. Uh, that's my second pseudo claim to fame. Magic Juice. Who here has never heard of Magic Juice? Okay. It's small matter. All right. Who here has never used Magic Juice? Yes. Lots of open minds, hopefully. <laughs> So, Magic Juice is a polishing compound product that I have been using for about nine years. Uh, not many people would use it because it comes in one gallon bottles. And it's insanely expensive to buy a one gallon bottle of something this big that takes uh, about 100 pin tubes. So, one ounce, 128 ounces in a gallon, that's a lot of pins to go through. So, I've been using it for about 10 years, and Vince Casey convinced me a little while uh, about two years ago now that, you know, you really should just bottle this in smaller bottles and sell it to people because this stuff is amazing. So here we are, two years later, and Magic Juice is uh, slowly taking over the world. Maybe not, but uh, it's a fun product uh, to work with. It's a six-step polishing compound that works amazing on pretty much any straight resin. So if it's a pure resin blank, go for it. You'll have a good time with it. If it's a hybrid blank, you need to seal the hybrid material before you can really use magic juice on it, uh, depending on what the hybrid material is. If it's a uh, fibrous um, wood or cloth or something like that, you probably need to seal that first before you get a proper shine out of it with magic juice. Uh, the other thing to worry about uh, out of magic juice, it is a water-based product. So if you're going to use it on that uh, hybrid uh, material, that wood, you're introducing wood with water mixture and it generally doesn't go so well. So that's why I say you need to seal it first. You need to seal it with a CA over the top of it or a craft coat. If you don't know anything about that, come see me. I'll talk to you off on it as well. Um, with uh, Magic Juice six step polishing compound, we start out with step one. For those of you who may have used it in the past that used to have a different numbering system, yeah, I fixed that. That's a lot of feedback. Thank you. I'll, I, I changed that around for you. So step one through step six, uh, uh, it takes about 20 to 30 seconds per step uh, to skip through those. And once you get done, you should have a very glass-like finish. Um, another interesting uh, piece that someone just uh, hit me up with this week, who has an older car, we'll say 15 years-ish old? What do your headlights look like? They're dull. <laughs> Magic Juice will fix that. <laughs> One of my customers who bought Magic Juice from me last year, he got another set and it was in his mail when he picked up his daughter from school and he said he sat in the parking lot waiting for his daughter to get out of school with a, a rag and just buffed one headlight. So he went home, he had one shiny clean glass headlight and the other was all yellowy tarnished. <laughs> So he fixed the other one when we got home in the driveway, but he, he said, I was quite amazed. I thought you were joking that you could use magic juice on your headlights, but no, it worked. So it is a polishing compound. It does uh, really well for that kind of stuff. Now, uh, what we're going to work with today is a, this is just a Sierra uh, blank. I'm actually going to turn this loosely to um, Liberty bushings that are on here. You're going to get my version of turning. Uh, there's lots of versions that are out there, but you get my biased opinion on how to turn give or take. Everybody's got their own ways of doing things. Once you get into it, it kind of sticks with you. I've been making pens now for about, oh, since 2008, math in public, that's what, 14 years now? Yeah, uh, so I've been doing it for a little while. I'm not saying I'm a, a amazingly seasoned veteran at it, but I consider myself well-versed in uh, making lots of pens. So I make uh, probably close to 800 pens a year. I sell a lot of pens at shows and things. So I've been in the game for a little while playing with it. So hopefully you guys can learn something from this and uh, we'll get busy turning little things here. Those of you in the, uh, the, the front seats up here, you might get some chips flying that little direction. So just giving you a heads up. It's okay, we'll just sue. <laughs> not a problem. Jason Rose. <laughs> Hit him up. This short, angry elf. 
It's always fun picking on Jason. All right, so uh, poll in the audience. How fast do you guys turn? As fast as my lady goes. Mine begins at 3,200. Mine's 28. My personal lathe at home is a Harvey T40. It's uh, I call that the Bugatti to, uh, of uh, lathes. I love that thing. It's amazing. It's my favorite lathe I have ever used in my life. Um, what's that? It's three thousand. It doesn't sound like it. What? This one? Oh, this thing is loud. My T40. You can turn on three thousand. You can't tell it's on. There's no wine to it or anything, but not docking jet or anything like that. It's just they're different motor types. Mine's a servo motor, and this is a uh, yes. I think is it brushless? Yeah. So it's different motor types, so it's different pieces. So 3,000 RPM is about where I stick at in turning, um, turning, sanding, polishing, all the same speed. I don't slow down for any of it. Uh, the only thing I do slow down for is drilling. I'll drill at about 1,600, 1,200, somewhere in there, uh, just because it's a lot of metal that's things slinging around. It just makes me a little nervous. So um, I tend to hog off a little more material than most people are comfortable with going through. And uh, I'm not used to chips flying up at me because my setup at home, if anybody has watched me do a live feed, I have a complete wooden shroud that I built over the top of my lathe with a six inch port off the back of it for dust collection. And it sucks everything away, Not hardly everything. A good 80% of stuff goes down the chute. Early on, the chips and chunks come flying out here and then my wife complains, I thought you had this fancy dust collector, it doesn't work. Well, it does. <laughs> Just not as well as she would like sometimes. Especially whenever I come in the house and I've got maybe a couple wood chips stuck to my shoe, come inside and then it gets stuck to her sock and then she yells at me for it. That's never happened to any of you guys, has it? Never? Just me, I figured. So, so I've got a trivia question that we're gonna work with here. I gotta remember the. Uh, Who's John Wayne? It's my uncle. So I have two trivia questions. One's for tomorrow when I do my off center turning. And uh, that one's more specific to stadium things in general. I can't remember what my trivia question was. I had this figured out. I'm trying to remember. While I'm trying to remember that. Anybody recognize what these jugs are up here? Are there any resin casters in the room? Anybody ever use, uh, or what resins do you guys use? Liquid diamond. Liquid diamond. Lumalite. Lumalite. I'm a little hard of hearing, you gotta say a little bit louder. Lumalite, urethane, uh, liquid diamonds, what else do we have out there? What's that? Total boot. Total boot epoxy. Okay, uh, anything else? All right, anybody ever hear of Royal Palm Resin? All right, anybody know Jason Burr? All right, Jason Burr was a good friend. Uh, really sad to uh, passed away. And uh, his Royal Palm Resin kind of disappeared with him. With my stadium seat materials that I use for my plastic seats, we use a lot of Royal Palm Resin. And with uh, Royal Palm Resin not really being available, I was struggling. So I had to find a alternative to use and I wasn't really liking any of the alternatives that we had tried out and messed around with. So doing a little bit of digging, you got a hold of a couple of the early developers and helpers. Ah, sneezing with the little things here. I got one tickle in my nose. <laughs> Stop it. So anyway, with uh, the guys that helped Jason Burr get everything off the ground and get moving and everything, I reached out to them and asked about potentially rebooting Royal Palm. And that's what I've done. 
So JB Royal is Royal Palm. I could not use the name Royal Palm, not in good conscience or potentially legal issues. But JB Royal is named after Jason Burr to give him full credit and tribute to where this resin came from. And we rebooted the brand. So we have the thin and the original viscosities of the resin. And it's moving forward. So it's uh, a really fun resin to use. It's a really easy resin to use. Uh, so if you have any other questions on that, I'd be happy to talk to you all afterwards about it and everything. But uh, we use it exclusively at Stadium Pin Blinks, and that's my fun bit to it. So get back up there. All right, so we'll get this turned down with a gentle bow through there. That'll work, we'll put a little bit there. Now, um, what do you guys normally do for your high gloss uh, resin finishes? Just give me a couple ideas what you guys mess around with. Anyway. Save it down to uh, 1,000 grit with Abernet and uh, use the Beal buffing system. Okay, so we got one vote for Beal buffer. Uh, any others? Yes, sir. I use uh, Abernet to about 600, and then I go to the uh, micro mesh sheets dry through the whole series, and then I use that strange product that you've got. Oh, magic juice? Okay. Well, you're going to get my biased opinion. I'm warning you up front on that. So this is the Michael Harden version of resin finishing. I use Norton sand wet paper. And a lot of people look at me like, why? It works for me. I, when you find something that works for you, you use it. If you find something that's slightly better, try it out. If it doesn't work for you, don't use it. If it does work for you, hey, maybe you should try something new. But I use Norton sand wet paper. And I start with, generally, uh, depending on how good a turning I did and how good uh, uh, the product is, sometimes I'll get some whatever resin that I'm turning. It might be a little chippy, and uh, I'll start with like a 220 uh, to go through it. But generally speaking, 220, 320, 400, 600, 800, 1200, 1500, and 2000 grit Norton sand wet paper. You do not need to sand that high with, uh, with uh, sanding to use magic juice. You can stop about 600 to 1000 and be just fine. However, I'm a bit of an overachiever, and I like to go full tilt on things at time, uh, uh, generally, so I'll go a little bit further. So like I said, I go up to 2,000 grit with the sandpaper, and it works for me, so I didn't really change doing it. This is the same process I've been using for over a decade now, and I've been happy with it, so I just keep doing it. So it's, uh, this is the 220, just going through it, then normally, I forgot to bring it because I'm a goofball. Normally I have one of these little squirt bottles like this, but it's a uh, 12 ounce bottle. And I usually sit over the top of my lathe. If you may watch me do a live feed, that's how I usually am lazy like that with my forearm on top of the lathe. And I'm dripping water on here as I'm going with the sandpaper. It's just a process that works for me, better than going back and forth with a cup of water. So um, one of the key things I can always tell you is especially with your rougher grits, don't use a lot of pressure, but use a lot of water. Water is a lubricant. It's gonna help flush all that material away from the blank as you're sanding it off. If you push too hard, you can create uh, striations in the blank and you'll get that silly looking barber pole look in uh, the blank and you won't be able to get that out. So you have to be a little more careful with it. Question. Yes, sir. Between your grips, do you remove the residue that's there? I'll wipe it down. Thank you. Usually whenever I'm doing my stuff at home and I have a little squirt bottle, I just use uh, squirt a little bit of extra water on it and wipe it down and that's good enough. But I always try to knock off what's there. I don't always remember. It's not the end of the world, but I try. I don't always succeed. What's that? What's your speed right now? 42,000. <laughs> 3,000. Uh, this is at uh, 3,000 RPM, but but you can uh, realistically 2,400 to 3,000. You're you're good in, in that range. 10,000. What's that? 10,000. <laughs> I like to plug up my router to it and just let it burn. <laughs> 
Once when I used to work in a woodcraft store, I had a gentleman come in and want to know if he could put a Forstner bit in his router if he turned it down slow enough. And I thought, well, well, you can. Would not suggest you do that, though. The, the results might vary. And he says, well, it fits in there. I said, just because it fits doesn't mean you should. But, you know, some people you just can't tell. There is that. It's pretty amazing. Uh, I always said, you know, there's such thing as a stupid question. <laughs> Hell, <laughs> after working with the general public, sometimes you learn that that's not a, uh, always a true statement because, like military intelligence, it's an oxymoron. Yes, I used to work in military intelligence. <laughs> and yes, I'm an oxymoron. <laughs> Does that mean I'm a cow and a moron at the same time? I forget what those words mean. Don't worry, the dad jokes only get worse as the day goes on. Oh, thank you. I, I forgot to uh, mention that. It comes in uh, 9 by 11 sheets and a 5 pack or a 25 pack or a 50 pack or something like that. I usually buy the 5 packs. And with the 5 packs, we'll stop that for just a second. We're on 600. With the five packs, what I do, I made like a little silly jig where I literally took a piece of Baltic birch scrap plywood, yay biggish, no exact measurements, just larger than the page, and then took a about a two inch strip uh, of Baltic birch. With that two inch strip, I put it on my table saw and ran it across with the blade one inch high and it up against my fence where I only took half a blade thickness off of it. So you understand what I mean? I'm cutting just a, a half blade. So I'm basically taking one layer of that Baltic birch uh, ply off of there. And the reason I do that, then I take it and lay them together. So then there's like that little gap underneath. So I just screw those, uh, I glued it down and screwed it down so it wouldn't come apart. And then I can take my sheets, slide it under the edge. So once I slide that under the edge, I'm got a one inch gap there. So I take the short side, the nine inch side, slide it under there, put a piece of, um, uh, just another piece of uh, quarter inch uh, Baltic birch ply just to use as a hold to hold the sandpaper so it won't move. Then take a utility knife and whack, rake it across there with a stiff hand and then it comes off you've got nine inch long strips. You can use scissors but not very long because those scissors will dull. <laughs> I had somebody ask why can't I just use some shears? You can but after about the fifth or sixth sheet those scissors are going to be in terrible shape. Utility knife blades are cheap. You can buy the hundred pack for what like six bucks and you know, I'll run through you know, a couple packs of sandpaper and throw the blade away or turn it around or whichever. But once I do that, I'll have one inch, nine, uh, one inch wide, nine inch long strips, and then I cut them in half. So I end up with one inch ish wide by four and a half ish long. There's a little ish in there. But like I said, you get my biased opinion. Cut those off, so one pack of five, I've now got 11 inches long, so that's 11 uh, strips, then I get two of us, that's 22, 22 times five, math and public widths, what, about 110 pieces? So I get 110 pieces out of that. Now, how far that goes? I use those same pieces of sandpaper for doing my wood turning and wood sanding and everything. We'll talk about that tomorrow, uh, about how I use the stuff a little bit differently with wood, but with resin, this one piece of sandpaper has six zones on it. Yes, I just got some strange looks. You fold that in half, you got one, two, three. Get back, where are you going? Get up here. Turn it over and you got four, five, and six. Everybody understand that? Oh, look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Four, five, six. And if you really want to push it, you can get eight out of it by just going long ways. So you hold it on here, but that takes talent to be able to hold it there and not go fling. Yep. So I generally will use six different zones on this sandpaper. So whenever I'm doing a lot of wet sanding uh, of blanks, I just I have a little shelf right here on my lathe section and I just like line them all up in order and I'll reuse all six of them. And I get six blanks out of six pieces of sandpaper and we have a good time. So it lasts a very long time for me. So that's the other reason why I like Norton Sandwet paper because it, it holds up really well for that. Sorry, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. So we're uh, 600 uh, here. 
to fly that on the Yep, um, I generally get it at Woodcraft because it's really close to me and they almost always have some in stock and I'll just buy one of each of them and I think they're about eight, nine dollars a pack, but I guess there's eight of them, but it's like once a year for me to buy that much and I'll go, th it'll last me a significantly long amount of time. All right, that was the 600. Here's the 800. Look, I even wrote scribblies on the back. I don't know, I don't know if you guys can see that, but I, I scribbled an eight on the back of it so I'd see it. So I'll run through the 800 real quick on here. Now everybody has their way of doing things. I know some guys have like a little Tupperware container they put under here and they dip in water and go back and forth. Yeah. I just, I don't. Um, my, uh, I usually leave my dust collector running while I do this and it sucks water into the dust collector. It's dry by the time it gets to the barrel because in my shop you've got three feet, about eight feet, 12 feet, 24 feet, another 10, 12 feet, before it even gets to the cyclone. I uh, had the fortunate opportunity to work some overtime about 10 years ago, and then bought a Clearview Cyclone. Anybody ever hear of Clearview Cyclones? That thing is amazing. Five horsepower motor. Roar, 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 roar. <laughs> to which my wife says, do you really need that? Yes, honey, I do. Believe it or not, the stupid PVC pipe that I used for it, six inch PVC pipe, costs more than the dust collector did. But I have about 150 feet of PVC running through my shop in a two car garage. So, all right, that was our 1200. And uh, we're moving up to our 1500. And what is the last grid I used? What did I tell you guys? See, somebody's paying attention up here. Not everybody's asleep. Nope. Not at all. And it's not a problem anywhere on my dust collection system except my planer. That one scares me sometimes because you're like static shock on it. It doesn't ever do anything. It's fine. I've never had any issues out of it. And I know a lot of guys that all run uh, say you have to do this or that and they argue back and forth on it. And maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. Maybe it's just fine. But like I said, you get the Michael Harden biased opinion. So uh, polishing. There are a couple things that you can use. Usually I have a, the old dish rag that was in the kitchen that has holes in it, or it's the pattern that's no longer in season that my wife says we can't have in the house anymore. So here you can use these in the shop. So I have that stack and I use them on my lathe all the time. So I use it to dry off everything or squirt, if it's wood, squirt acetone on it to wipe any extra oils off. And so they always get used. But for uh, polishing these things, I'm using brawny paper towels. Why brawny? Because that's what Costco has. So, one sheet of paper towel. Use my belly here. Fold it in half, fold it in half, and I fold it in half. We have a one inch long strip. I'm gonna take my scissors that aren't dull because I didn't cut sandpaper, that are sitting on my workbench at home. Don't. I don't know. Thank you, sir. Sorry, we're cutting paper with your knife. Oh, oh hang on, we're not done yet. You want to make sure it's really done. Yeah. Thank you, sir. No, we'll be good. Just need one. So, four pieces. I'm a little frugal like that. Cheap, frugal, whatever you want to call it. So, again, there are six polishing zones on this piece of paper towel. One, two, three. Four, five, six. 
Some people argue it's like you're being silly. Like, well, obviously, it's kind of point. If you're not having fun, it's kind of boring. Now, for what you guys all came to see, Magic Juice. When you buy a set of Magic Juice in the one ounce or two ounce, this does not apply to the sample set. When you buy the one ounce or two ounce, snake oil salesman here. There is a little safety seal on the top of this. That was feedback I got, you know, a couple of them that leaked in the mail. And it's like, yeah, just can't trust the postman sometimes or the UPS man or the FedEx lady or whatever. So we're going to put just about a pencil eraser dot on the tip of here or an English pea size. Where's my camera? <laughs> There? There? There we go. Ah, there we go. Now, can you guys see that? Oh, it's that camera. I've been looking at that camera the whole time. That's what's been messing with it. So we got a little English pea-sized piece on there. So it doesn't take much. Now, uh, anybody follow um, Zach Higgins? Did you see him use magic juice on his video? Did you see him say, oh, it just splattered all over me? Because he didn't listen to me whenever I talked to him beforehand when he asked me, hey, so how do I do this? <laughs> so he was in a hurry and everything. It's not a big deal. So you don't just take him and go in or else you should be wearing all the stuff. It's going to be on the screen, it's on you, it's on the wall, it's on the lathe. I gently come into it. So I'll just touch just the edge of the bubble on here. I don't know if you guys can see how well this goes, but I'll just touch the edge of it a little bit and paint the whole blank with it. Once I get the whole blank, then I'll just kind of... Go back and forth on it. Not much. You're buffing. You're not friction polishing. Friction polishing you, friction. You want heat. Buffing, no heat. Heat's the enemy. So, first piece is done there. Let's see it caught on. I should be doing a show in Vegas. So, we'll move on to the next piece. Zone one done. Zone two coming. There's not any on there. It, it'll, generally speaking, if you have residue on there, you still have buffing to do. That should show up a little bit better. All right, steps one and two are the thickest uh, materials out of it. So they show up a little bit more. Now, when you're buffing with this, it will feel a tiny bit gritty at the beginning of each one of them, and then it'll get really slick and smooth. Once it gets that slick and smooth, you're done. Move to the next one. All right, there's our three. You see me putting my finger on the bottom here? I'm feeling for wet spots. See, because if there's any more on there, it'll still be there. I can just go ahead and buff that little bit out. Don't want those to dry out, then it's a pain. If your bottles ever dry out in the caps, you just take the cap off and rinse it through some hot, warm water. And not soapy water, just hot, warm water. It'll clean all that out of there. If it doesn't clean it out, just let it soak for a bit. It'll be fine. I'm sorry? Shelf life? I, I, shelf life. Oh, shelf life. I have no clue. And I, I'm being honest with it because I've got magic juice that I, was, I bought in the gallon jug. And it was going on seven years. And it still worked perfectly fine. The only thing is the, uh, don't let it freeze because uh, it will separate because it's water-based. If it does freeze, it's not the end of the world. Just get it thaw, get it back to room temperature, shake vigorously, and you'll be fine. But shelf life on it, I, mean, I haven't had any issues with it lasting multiple years. So your mileage may vary. Don't freeze. It, it's, it was 102 in my shop this summer. You know where my uh, bottles sit? Right here on the shelf above my lathe where it's 102. Do I turn when it's 102 degrees? Yes, sir, because I'm crazy. I have a fan right here blowing this way. I got a fan over this way blowing this way. We try and create a cyclone in the shop. I fail miserably at it when the doors open, but hey, I'm not in the house watching QVC. My wife's favorite channel. 
God, I hate that channel. Do you know how many things I've had to take to the post office to return? <laughs> it's bad enough they know me because I'm bringing Stadium Pin Blanks boxes in there and I have to get separate receipts because she doesn't want to look through the long 14 item, 23 item receipt for hers, so I have to have separate receipts. But the post office people, they know me by name. Oh, these must be for Abby. <laughs> how do you know? Oh, because it's not one of your little small packages. Now, I don't know if you guys can see this very well, but there we go. The uh, number six bottle is much thinner. So don't go using the same amount of pressure you're squirting out for the others to use on this one because you're going to make a big, huge puddle in your hand. If you do, it's not the end of the world. Just take the cap off of it, scrape it back in the bottle. Remember, I'm cheap. Scrape it back in the bottle, you'll be fine. Trying to get any extra gritty pieces in there though, it's kind of works against your favor there. But this is step six and our final step, and I don't know how good or bad or indifferent the screen is showing up there for you guys, but we're gonna pass it around the room. Somebody asked about the little container up here. No, they, are, they don't come with the set. They are an option to get afterwards, and they are all black. This one is the show special that is being given away today. This blank is a blank from Tim McKenzie, because I always use one of his blanks because the diamonds are all sparkly and pretty. But uh, the blank, I think that's red. I'm colorblind, I can't tell half the time. Um, it is red, because he said it was Red Dragon was the name of the blank. So. There's the, ori there's the original, and there's the super shiny to look at on a really dull screen, so we're going to pass around the room so you guys can take a look at it up close. Now, um, like I said, the, don't fall off of there, here you go, um, but the uh, uh, Magic Juice uh, set the six ounce uh, the, um, the six step set comes in three different sizes. You have a sample pack, and it comes in like little third of uh, third of an ounce uh, containers, ten milliliter. Uh, these are thirty milliliter, one ounce, and then there's the two ounce. It's actually more than that in the bottle because the way they have it measured, it's only supposed to go up to like the the bend in the neck. And well, if you get a bottle, it looks like you got cheated. So I just squirt them and fill them all the way up to the top as much as I can. <laughs> So my son thinks it's a little silly, but that's what we do. So uh, any questions? I'll make up the answers, I promise. Do you ever use any finishing waxes? Nope, not anymore. Gotcha. Um, the step six is uh, the glass step, the last step, glass step, last step that I use. Uh, and I have had uh, great success with it. Uh, like I said earlier, I've been using this polishing set uh, setup for about nine years now and just started selling it two years ago about two years ago now no nope, earlier than that because we had it at mid ohio 2019 i believe i think i can't remember did. yeah we did yep i remember doing the demo for it now it's been two years ago i've slept since then but anyhow, like I said, I've been, been, using, uh, been selling for a little while now, I've sold lots of sets. There's, uh, uh, it's available at stadiumpinblanks.com, obviously, that's where it's uh, primarily from. But also I have vendors, uh, Jason Rose at Speakeasy sells it, uh, Nails at um, Classic Nibs slash Arizona Silhouette, uh, or Classic Silhouette or Arizona Nib, however you want to look at them. <laughs> uh, they have it as well as uh, Turner's Warehouse and uh, Drop Anchor Creations and one other Bullseye Turning Supply. Uh, they're all vendors for me here in the States. I uh, just picked up a Canadian retailer because Canadian shipping on one of these sets is like 23 bucks first class. Canadian postage, it just sucks. I feel bad for those guys up there. So we, I just shipped like 60 sets and it was only $80 to ship 60 sets. So well, I have a vendor up there. I'm working on a vendor over in the UK. It doesn't really apply to you guys, but if you know somebody who's looking, just let them know that's what's happening. So it's all the kind of fun things. Yes, sir. Follow up with a wax question. Most people use Renaissance wax or some other type of white mm -hmm. crystalline wax to prevent fingerprints from you can do that uh, for the whole fingerprint aspect of it, but in reality, it's a pen. It's constantly in your hands, 
and the oils and things in your hand is going to destroy that uh, Renaissance wax and it's breakdown. It's going to be gone inside of like a day max. Personal opinion, you're getting my, like I said at the beginning, disclaimer, you're getting my personal biased opinion. I've used Renaissance wax in the past. I just don't think it's worth that, uh, a step worth, uh, worth needing right now. So whenever I do a lot of my pins and displays and stuff, if I've got stuff that I'm putting in a glass case that nobody's really going to be touching, I may put it on that because I will uh, set it up that way. But that, that's that's just the way I do it. You touch things in the museum either, so. Exactly. But whenever you pin, who who makes a pin and never uses it? I have customers who have bought stadium blank pins for me, and literally the guy took a Forbes Field blank with the Forbes Field certificate, took it to Michael's, and had them custom frame it in a frame, and it's on the wall in his house, and he never uses it. No, it fell off the wall. What's that? It fell off the wall. Oh, did it? Yes. Oh, was that you? No. Oh, I honestly don't remember. It was one early on when I did it, and he tells me, "Yeah, it's framed on the wall at the house now." I'm like, well, okay, <laughs> but it, yes, sir. You did everything at three thousand. Yes, sir. Uh, I used to turn uh, what I referred to as my hair's on fire fast, but then I got a bigger lathe that goes faster than my hair on fire fast, <laughs> so I, I cap it at like three thousand. Um, my lathe at home will do forty-two hundred, and. It'll get warm at 4,200, and if I run it for more than a couple hours at that, uh, it'll get hot, and I really don't want to deal with that. So I just cap it at 3,000. 3,000 is perfectly fast and fine for what I'm doing, and I'm one of those guys that I'll sand, or I'll turn, sand, and finish all at the same speed. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, the only time I change the speed down on it is, like I said earlier, is whenever I'm drilling, or um, squaring to sand the end when I have a big faceplate on here. That's the only time I really changed that.